Laura Hunt was born on the 22nd of June, 1837, in the small town of Holly Springs in Mississippi. Her family moved around a lot, as Laura's father did not have a steady job and would travel to wherever he could find work. Eventually, they ended up in New Orleans. She was a very pretty girl with a charming nature, and in 1853, when she was 16 years old, she married a gentleman named William Stone, who worked as an alcohol dealer. He was 20 years older than Laura, but a year later, in 1854, he died, leaving Laura a 17-year-old widow. Following her husband's death, Laura enrolled in a school to train to become a teacher. Before she finished her studies, she married again, this time to a man named Thomas Grayson. However, he proved to be a poor choice of husband. He would often drink and was sometimes violent. Within six months of getting married, Laura had had enough and started divorce proceedings. Along with her mother, she left Mississippi and set up home in California, settling in San Francisco. They stayed there for a short time before moving on to Shasta, where Laura met the county sheriff named William Fair. Again, he was significantly older than her, but he was a very respectable and charming gentleman who worked as an attorney. They married and Laura gave birth to a daughter who they named Lillian Lorraine. William decided it would be better for his wife and child if they all lived in San Francisco. They moved to the city, but life there was not quite as easy as he had imagined. He found it hard to establish his practice. His income diminished and it became increasingly more difficult to provide for his family. William Fair committed suicide in December 1861. Laura was now 24 years old and had been married three times, twice widowed and once divorced. William did not leave a fortune in his will, but with the money she inherited, she moved to Sacramento, where she purchased a boarding house, which she planned to run with the assistance of her mother. Unbeknown to Laura, Sacramento did not have many visitors at the time, as the state government was in recess. She struggled to make any money, and faced with large debts, she was left with little choice other than to find a job. She landed a role as an actress at the Maguire Opera House in San Francisco. She was by all accounts a very good actress, but when the production finished, she decided not to continue with her acting career and instead left California and headed to Nevada, where she opened a boarding house in Virginia City. Her arrival coincided with a large discovery of silver ore located under the eastern slope of Mount Davidson, close to Virginia City. This was the first major discovery of silver ore in the United States and sparked a silver rush of prospectors to the area, all trying to stake their claims. As the mining camp started to grow, the city became a bustling commercial centre. Laura and her mother owned the 37-room Tahoe House Hotel. Business boomed and Laura, with her youthful looks and elegant manner, became a well-known and well-liked figure in the city. One of the many people who travelled to Virginia City to try and make some quick money was a 47-year-old San Francisco lawyer and a former California state legislator named Alexander Crittenden. He was originally from Lexington in Kentucky and had graduated from the West Point Military Academy. He remained in the army for about a year before he left and started to work in the railroad business. He married and moved to Texas where he studied to become an attorney. Alexander was from a wealthy and well-connected family, so he was soon admitted to the bar. And then in 1852, he moved to California. Success seemed to come easily for him. He started his own law firm and was elected to the state legislature, on which he served for four years, eventually becoming the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. After he finished his political career, he returned to San Francisco and carried on working in his law firm. But now with seven children and the thoughts of the large amounts of money that the silver mines were generating, Alexander Crittenden decided that he would very much benefit financially if he went to Virginia City and set up his own law practice. He arrived in 1864 and rented a room 
at the very nice Tahoe House Hotel, owned by Mrs. Laura Fair. He was tall, handsome, and articulate, and the young, free-spirited Laura paid him a lot of attention. Soon they started to spend evenings together, and then nights. Other hotel residents would whisper that Alexander Crittenden was a very special guest, and within a few months of first meeting, Laura and Alexander would walk around the city streets together and declare that they were both very much in love. Laura had been married three times and was very keen that the new man in her life make her his wife. She pressured Alexander into marrying her, constantly asking him when they would legally marry. At the time, society drew a sharp distinction between married and unmarried women, and Laura was keen that she preserved her good reputation. Alexander agreed to marry her, but put off any wedding dates. He would tell her that he just had a few things to sort out first and try to buy himself a few more weeks before she would bring the subject up again. His practice started to prosper. He would travel back to California to visit his family, but life suddenly changed when in early 1865, his wife named Clara insisted that she and the children join him in Nevada. Now he had a problem as his mistress and his wife were going to be living in the same city. This was not San Francisco with a population of 150,000, where it would have been easier to keep secrets from Clara. Virginia City was a lot smaller. The population was 25,000, and both he and Laura had become well-known residents and had never disguised their feelings for each other. He had no choice but to tell Laura that he was married and that his wife and children would be joining him in Virginia City. Laura was very upset by the revelation. She had wondered if Alexander had been entirely truthful with her, but she had been so infatuated with him, she took him at his word. He insisted that he wanted to be with her and promised to get a divorce. However, when Clara arrived, he rented a nice house for all his family to live in and also kept his room at the hotel. When his wife questioned him as to why he needed to keep the room, he told her that it was very important to do so for business reasons. He would now spend his days with Laura and his evenings with his wife. He became very adept at moving between the hotel and the house and would tell both ladies exactly what they wanted to hear. He was reluctant to give up Laura and kept on promising to divorce his wife. But he had young children, a successful company and a very good reputation. He was very well aware that abandoning his wife and children to become the fourth husband of Laura Fair would be very much frowned upon by the prominent social circle he operated in and would only have a detrimental effect on his business. For the next five years, Alexander managed to keep his mistress and his wife apart, while Laura would keep on asking when he was going to divorce and marry her. It seemed that Clara Crittenden was unaware of her husband's infidelity. Alexander was a skilled attorney. He had many clients, which included wealthy individuals and relatively large companies. As his Virginia City law firm had become established, he started to spend time working at his principal law practice back in San Francisco. During this time, when he was traveling between both cities, rumors started to surface that he had a mistress. In an attempt to end all the speculation, he insisted that Laura Fair was nothing more than an acquaintance that he had known for a number of years, as she was the owner of the Tahoe House Hotel. It soon became very apparent but if Alexander wanted to operate a law practice in both Nevada and California, he would not be able to keep his wife and a mistress. Eventually, he gave in to Laura's demands and told her that he would divorce Clara. He said he would do this in Indiana, as the courts were more lenient there. He instructed her to travel to New York, where he would meet her so they could travel together to Indiana. As usual, Laura believed his every word and waited for him. But Alexander never arrived, and eventually Laura received a letter telling her that a financial issue had meant that he was unable to travel. She was incensed, but a few weeks later, he persuaded her to meet him in the beautiful and very fashionable town of White Sulphur Springs. 
Here they again announced their undying love for each other. The relationship continued. Laura moved back to San Francisco along with her mother and daughter. Alexander would visit her and still tell her that he would eventually divorce Clara. But by 1870, Laura had grown tired of his empty promises. The couple argued more frequently and she wondered if she had wasted the last six years with a man who had deceived her. She was now 33 years old and was still often approached by gentlemen, very keen to court her, one of whom was a very elegant man named Jesse Schneider. They had a brief relationship before he became her fourth husband. On learning that Laura had married, Alexander was distraught. He wrote her a string of letters proclaiming his love. In one letter he wrote, I am wretched, insufferably, infinitely wretched. I have no heart or mind for anything. I can think of nothing but you. When he met her again, they agreed that they had to be together and both promised to get a divorce. Laura's divorce was finalised on the 5th of October 1870 and now she was convinced that at last she would be with the man she loved. She sold some of her furniture and prepared herself to move to Alexander's house. She was aware that his wife Clara and the children had been sent east and she presumed that that was in order for her to come to terms with the divorce. But Alexander Crittenden was not going to divorce his wife. In fact, he had not even discussed any such thing with her. And when Laura learnt that Clara would soon be returning from her trip and her husband was going to meet her, she was enraged. She went to Kearney Street and asked a gunsmith to exchange the Colt revolver she owned for a smaller and more modern four-barrel pistol, one that could easily be concealed in a lady's bag. She learned that Clara and the three children who had accompanied her on the trip would be returning on November the 3rd and arriving at the railway station in Oakland. When the day came, Laura dressed herself completely in black, including a veil to cover her face, and slipped the newly acquired pistol into her bag. She then took a boat to Oakland, where she patiently waited for the train to arrive. She noticed Alexander sitting nearby. If he saw her, he would have no idea of who this mysterious lady was. She did not look out of place, as at the time many women who had been recently widowed would wear black dresses and a full-length black veil when out in public places. When the train pulled up at the station, Clara Crittenden and the three children disembarked and Alexander walked towards them. Laura noticed that everything seemed normal. Clara took his arm and they made their way to Oakland Pier to board the ferry boat to take them back to San Francisco. Obscured behind her veil, Laura sat close by and carefully observed the couple. Then suddenly, just as the boat was leaving the port, she walked over to Alexander. When he saw the strange veiled lady approach, he stood up. As she got closer, she took the pistol from her bag and shot him once in the chest. Then she calmly walked away. Alexander fell to the floor. The crew of the boat rushed to his aid. Another went to Laura, who was by now sitting down and was quite still and not making a sound. The crew member disarmed her. And when the boat arrived in San Francisco, Laura Fair was placed under arrest. She did not deny shooting the unarmed gentleman on the boat. She simply said that the man had ruined her life and the life of her daughter and she had intended to kill him. Alexander Crittenden was not in fact dead. He was taken to his home where he lived for another 48 hours before eventually succumbing to his injuries. On the day of his funeral, the federal, state and municipal courts adjourned and it was at the time one of the largest funerals ever held in San Francisco. Laura Fair's trial began on March 27th 1871 and proved to be a sensation. As the crime had been reported in all the newspapers, it had come to the attention of many prominent campaigners in the movement for women's rights, and they tried to make it more of a question about 19th century American society and morality, and less about the actual fact that Laura Fair 
had shot Alexander Crittenden. Laura's attorneys claimed that at the time of the incident, she was not in fact sane and had suffered partial intellectual insanity and partial moral insanity. They eloquently described a charming, caring lady whose state of mind had been corrupted by years of emotional abuse from the victim. Laura herself told the court that she had no memory of what she had done. The prosecution painted a very different picture of a defendant. They said that she had no history of mental instability and had meticulously planned her crime. She had purchased a new gun, gone to the train station, followed her victim onto the boat and shot him. It was a crime that was obviously planned by a very logically thinking person. Other witnesses said that Laura pursued men of a certain financial and social status and that money was a motivator behind all the men she courted. One witness described her as a loose woman, while Clara Crittenden innocently informed the court that she was a selfless loving wife and Laura Fair was a calculating and manipulative woman who for years had tried to persuade her husband to leave her and break up their family. When the trial ended, the jury retired to deliberate. It was thought that this may take some time, as a trial had been going on for nearly a month. But in fact, the jury returned in less than an hour and delivered the verdict of guilty. Laura was sentenced to be hanged on July the 28th. There was a mixed reaction in San Francisco, but the majority of people thought the verdict was just. The defence lodged an appeal, and while it was being considered, Laura's execution date was suspended. Eventually the verdict was overturned on technicalities and a new trial was ordered, which commenced in September 1872. Laura attended court every day, dressed entirely in black and wore a black veil. When the trial ended, she was found not guilty due to temporary insanity. The verdict caused a sensation in San Francisco. Most people seem to think that even if Laura didn't hang for her crime, she should at least serve a relatively long time in prison. There were those, however, who thought the verdict was just and that Laura's mind had been so unfairly corrupted by a man who had acted very dishonorably towards her. Now a free woman, Laura continued to live in San Francisco and as time passed, she became a far less prominent figure and could walk into the city without being noticed. She died on the 19th of October, 1919, aged 82. Hello everyone. Some of you may have noticed that today's video didn't have an introduction or the boom sound when going from different parts of the story, such as when transitioning from the background to the crime. I get lots of comments on the boom sound. Some say they really like it, but other people say they consider it unnecessary. Any comments you may have on the format of today's video or whether you'd like me to bring back the boom really would be appreciated. Thank you so much for listening and I hope to see you in the next brief case.